News at 5, 6, and 10. Welcome to This Week in Kansas with your host, Tim Brown. Hello and welcome to This Week in Kansas. Thank you for being with us this morning. A controversial bill would have a huge impact on Kansas farmers and the amount of taxes they pay on farmland. Now, some are calling an attack on the family farm. U.S. Attorney Barry Grissom called out Secretary of State Chris Kobach for a statement Kobach made about voter fraud prosecution. Grissom says Kobach has referred no voter fraud cases to his office for prosecution in four and a half years. Kobach had claimed that Grissom wouldn't prosecute. And Representative Virgil Peck is at it again. Now he is denying he had anything to do with the infamous House Bill 2234. Plenty to talk about this morning, but let's start with the state budget and the challenges that uh, lawmakers face with the budget this year, PJ. It just seems like it. Good morning. We'll get you back to this week in Kansas in just a second, but it's a winter weather alert day here on Cake and all across Cakeland. We do have snowfall ongoing right now. In fact, Wichita has just been added to a winter weather advisory until 3 o'clock this afternoon. We could see an additional 1 to 2 inches. We already have 1.2 inches officially over Eisenhower National Airport. Across western Kansas, winter storm warning still ongoing for Goodland, as well as for Garden City Dodge, as well as for Liberal and for Elkhart. Let me give you a lot look downtown from our Emprise Bank key cam here in Wichita. The snow has started to pick up again here in the metro. Across western Kansas, still some snow ongoing over toward Garden City. And from our weather bug network over toward Hugoton, there still is some snowfall. And snowfall amounts have been pretty impressive so far with this storm system. More than half a foot of snowfall in Goodland, right around half a foot in Garden City, as well as for Leota, four to four and a half inches in Sharon Springs, as well as for Colby. We're going to add to the snowfall total over the next couple of hours. Right now, the heaviest of the snowfall is down toward Anthony and Winfield, but that's starting to press its way up toward Wichita, so we could see an additional one to two inches. Catching a break, though, across much of western Kansas, especially over towards Syracuse. Light snowfall still ongoing for Garden City as well as for Ulysses and Dodge, and across northwest Kansas, there is still some snowfall in and around Colby and Goodland. I think we'll add to the snowfall totals later on today. To the east of Wichita, over toward portions of Butler, County, I think we'll see a trace to one inch of total accumulation. Otherwise, one to three inches for Wichita and Winfield, probably closer to three inches in some locations, as well as for Hayes and Great Bend, five to nine inches in and around Dodge City, as well as for Garden City, and five to nine as well in Goodland. We'll keep you updated for the rest of today. Now back to This Week in Kansas. Raised, the state legislature has to approve that, and now there's starting to be people in the legislature who say, well, maybe we bonded enough, and Maybe we should just leave the, the fund alone. Uh, you know, it, it just, it, it does seem to get more and more difficult. And I want to bring uh, Jim Ward into the conversation from Topeka. Jim is actually at the, in the uh, State House up in Topeka this evening. And Jim, you know, it, it um, I, I don't know, it seems like the problems get worse. We've lowered the bar when we come to the, the revenue estimates, but we still aren't quite hitting where we even lowered it to. Yeah, this is a financial disaster. It, it continues to get worse. Um, the governor is proposing to take almost a billion dollars out of the highway plan, which would virtually end our maintenance and any new projects. He's proposed to slash $130 million more million from K-12 education on top of the $30 million he took out in January. He, took, he stole $59 million from CAPERS. Um, he's proposing to borrow $1.5 billion dollars um, it is just lunacy, and it doesn't seem that anyone in the building or the room I'm sitting in right now or a lot of people still haven't got their arms around. We have a fiscal crisis, and it's caused because 191,000 Kansans are paying no state income tax while still using services. Let's bring uh, Chapman Rackaway from Fort Hay State University into the conversation. Chapman, I think a lot of people would say that this, this fiscal crisis that we've heard so much about is self-inflicted. No, that's true. There's, there's no way around it. The, the income tax changes make up the most significant chunk of the uh, shortfall that we've been experiencing. So, and that's why I think you're hearing a, a number of state legislators, even conservative Republicans now, who are saying, well, maybe, maybe we need to look at the income taxes and slowing down the, the glide path to zero or bringing things back to where they were. Well, and this is even a situation where Governor Brownback said, hey, this is my fault. The legislature passed this. This wasn't really what I wanted, but, uh, but he signed it. 
They played a game of chicken with each other in 2012. Let's remember this. <clears throat> the governor wanted the, the zero income tax and then he wanted to compensate for it with some other fees and uh, sales taxes and so on. And then the state Senate sent him one daring him basically to veto it that didn't include or that, that didn't include the other revenue generating things and his tax cuts. But when you play a game of chicken with politics, the the real people who lose are the kids in the schools. They're the people who are using the roads. They're the people who need uh, social and rehabilitative services. Um, so we can apportion as much blame as we want to. I think we know where this came from. What we need to hear, and hopefully we're going to hear as the 2016 and 2017 biennial budget starts coming out, is what are some substantive, constructive ways to build revenues back up? Or, and Jim Ward, I want your thoughts on this, so what uh, a lot of the Republicans will say is, let's not build the revenues back up, let's, let's cut more and cut spending. And, and quite frankly, that's what's going to have to happen if they want to stay this course. And I think this is kind of where it, it, it almost gets into it being a bit of a shell game because we see, you know, the governor making cuts in some areas, yet proposing increases in other areas, but still saying, hey, we cut taxes. Well, you may have cut taxes over here, but if you're raising taxes over here and you're still not cutting spending, you, you've got to equal that amount. And it's just kind of a shell game, it seems like to me, Robin Peter to pay Paul. Yeah, and, there, and right now in Topeka, it's no longer a question of whether taxes are going to go up. The question is whose taxes and how much. The governor continues to spend to pound on the middle class and the working class in terms of sales tax and gas tax and cigarette tax and all of these regressive taxes while protecting the 191,000 people who pay no state income tax at all while still using services. And there's a big conflict because there is a group of legislators who believe that this is a, a fiscal crisis is okay because it allows us now to cut state government as they call it starve the beast well the beast in kansas is public schools k-12 spends 50 cents of every dollar higher ed spends another 15 cents so 65 cents of every tax dollar that topeka spends is education that's the that's what's getting starved the highway plans that kansas are very proud of and invested in over the last 30 or 40 years that is going to stop now Highway patrol, law enforcement, the um, majority party, Republicans, just passed a bill to let people out of jail early because they can't, the, the bed space is too high and um, they can't, they have no money to, to house these people. We're talking about what do Kansans want for essential services. At some point in time, you end those essential services. Well, and, and Jim, we're cutting the programs for the people that are in prison anyway, so you might as well let them out because we're not doing anything for them while they're in. And I, I that's right, but here's really the problem. That, for, but you know, no, my but, point is on this: is if you're not going to, if you're not even going to make the attempt to rehabilitate by cutting these programs, then when you do let them out, you've got worse criminals. Right. That's a, that's absolutely true. And here's what's going to happen: it's happened in the past. When you let people out of jail early without any of the services to help them rehabilitate, then they just reoffend, and sometimes in ways that are horribly sad for the community. Um, yeah, we're making decisions like that every day. Yeah. PJ, uh, Jim mentioned regressive taxes, and I, I think this is, a, this is a point that bears repeating. We, we talk about consumption taxes. These are truly regressive taxes, and I, I really do feel that way because if you're going to tax, uh, if you're going to raise taxes on, on, on something that you and I purchase, but the, the millionaire down the street purchases exactly the same amount, there's a fairness issue, fairness issue, and 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 I'll, you know even more so. You know that loaf of bread costs the same amount to the millionaire as it does to the guy that's making seven bucks an hour. That's absolutely true. And that's where it's not fair. And it, it's it's definitely not fair in terms of the percentage of income that gets spent on these taxes. If you if you look at you know most of the income tax bracket things are all done in percentages of your of your income um, taxable income. Well, if you look at percentages of what someone is paying out of their disposable income on these kind of regressive taxes, that percentage to the guy go living paycheck to paycheck and trying to raise his kids and, and hoping that public school still stays somewhat affordable um, 
is is looking at um, at a huge hugely larger percentage yeah. of his disposable income going to pay these taxes than the than the millionaire you did or much, even the thousandaire. You did a much better job verbalizing that than I did, but that's exactly what, what the point is. If you look at percentage income versus you know spent on, on necessities like that, it, it's, it impacts a, a, a person with a low income much, much more heavily than it does with a person with a high income. And we're, we're also you know one of the few states that, that uh, fully tax groceries. And we're going to save that for segment three. That's okay. my segue because we're going to talk <laughs> about that in segment three. But but it's it's it, it bears. I think it's a point that bears repeating, and I think it's a good point. And and uh, you know we just we're we're in a we're and, in a difficult situation right and now. And prescription drugs. We yeah. have a sales tax on prescription drugs. So, yeah. and not many states do. And that is and you know that's another thing that it's something that the poor person can't really afford not to purchase if they're going to try to stay um, you know well enough to be employed. Um, and Percentage-wise, it's a huge part of their income. All right, we're going to take a commercial break. When we come back, we will continue our discussion on taxes, specifically taxes on farmland, which uh, is a huge issue in rural Kansas right now. We'll be back in two minutes. During the President's Day sale at Furniture Row, get a free $500 Apple gift card with select room groups, four years no interest, 20% off all rugs, lighting, and home decor, and much more. The President's Day sale at Furniture Row ends Wednesday. Stay big on health and beauty essentials from Procter & Gamble at Menards. Freshen your breath with Scope Mouthwash. A bottle of cool mint flavor is $3.49. Keep your hair healthy with head and shoulders. Shampoo and conditioner bottles are $4.49 each. Brighten up your home with LED bulbs from Sylvania. Replace a 60-watt incandescent bulb with this general purpose LED bulb or a 65-watt incandescent bulb with this LED floodlight. Both lasting you up to 22 years. $7.99 each. Save big money at Menards. Check this guy out. He's got a bunch of statues of himself and his dog. He's got a pool filled with salt water from the Dead Sea. He's got an ascot room. But he lives in an internet slow zone, which means unless he switches to Cox, the internet in my apartment is faster than this palace. So I win. Mr. Norwick Turner Reeves Goodspeed III. I win. Avoid slow zones. Get fast speeds everywhere with Cox High Speed Internet as low as $19.99 a month. Ask how to get a $200 prepaid card. Ten years ago, police caught a notorious serial killer, ending decades of terror for Wichita. But while society is safe from BTK, his brutal crimes impact the lives of his victims every day. Wednesday at 10, I reconnect with Charlie Otero and Steve Relford, finding two men on very different paths and one friendship forged in the pain they share. Steve understands me and I understand Steve like probably not too many other people do. The Legacy of BTK, a tale of two lives, Wednesday night at 10, only on Cape News. During the President's Day sale at Denver Mattress, save big on our Factory Direct Special Summit Queen Mattress, now just $199, and save up to $200 on select Tempur-Pedic mattress sets. Better tomorrow, start tonight at Denver Mattress. Some people are calling it an attack on the family farm. Many people are very upset in rural Kansas uh, about a Senate bill that would actually increase, on average, the valuation of farmland by f close to 500%, 473% according to the Kansas Department of Revenue. Huge increase, and, and uh, this has farmers pretty, pretty upset. And, you know, you can't blame them when you look at that kind of an increase. This would, this would I would imagine, bankrupt a lot of smaller farmers and, and larger farmers, for that matter. Well, and, and it, it would have, a, it have so many bad effects on so many people that I think the people who, the, the person who introduced it and who defended it as saying farmers have it too good and it's about time they learned how the world works or something, uh, has no idea how farms work. Um, his skill level when it comes to um, a assessing the finances of a farm are obviously absent. The, the problem with, um, with, with a huge property tax increase, and, and I believe I sat in this chair at the time we were cutting income taxes and said this is going to come home to roost on some people who routinely pull the red lever and don't, re and don't realize that this is going to come home to hit them. Yeah. And it's coming home to hit them. The, the fact that um, that farms, farmlands don't operate like a lot of other businesses. They don't manufacture a product that they have control over the price of when they sell it. So they can't pass along an added business expense the way, say, a Cessna could. Mm -hmm. um, if, if Cessna had to sell all their airplanes at public auction for whatever the highest bid was, then that would be somewhat comparable to what you're looking at in a, in a futures market situation, which sets the price of what the farm product is. So you can't raise your price to compensate for these kind of giant increases. Um, 
the other pe the other class that I don't think they've realized how hard would be hit are all the people who are retired landowners. The landowner pays that huge property tax bill. In a lot of cases, he's in a nursing home or in in Hayes or Lyons or somewhere, and his income from the farm is what he pays his nursing home bill with. Um, a 473 percent increase in his property taxes are going to make him sell the farm. Uh, I think we've already seen, you know, the the consolidation of of small farms and, and even some large farms. We've seen huge sales of farmland. Um, the valuations on farmland um, are beginning to stabilize and come back down into somewhat of a more normal realm. This will not help that kind of a situation. Uh, it won't. It's it's a situation that would really hurt the. Um, main streets of small towns. You take the money out of the farmer's pocket and you've, you've created a real problem. Plus we've already got counties all over western Kansas particularly that have raised mill levies in an effort to shore up the losses to their school districts. Jim, uh, Republican Senator Jeff Meltzer who introduced the bill I think maybe we misunderstand this because actually he's doing farmers a favor here. He's trying to help them, and I quote, understand how everyone else has been taxed. So maybe he's just doing this to be nice. No, no, he's not. He's a senator from Johnson County, and Johnson County derives or pays taxes in a much different way than people in Johnson City, Kansas do. This is, again, a misguided attempt to fill a hole of almost a billion dollars in deficit because of the tax plan. And it's the wrong thing to do. I think um, she just explained really well that it's going to hurt family farmers first. And it's one of two bills that were introduced. The other one was to put the sales tax back on farm machinery, which is about $73 million in tax increase. All of these are an attempt to avoid the, the, the issue, which is 191,000 people are not paying income tax in Kansas. You just can't run a state and provide essential services with that kind of gaping hole in your revenue. And that all of these ideas you're seeing, most of which are just really bad tax policy, bad economic policy, are an attempt to avoid that conversation. You know, Chapman, it's interesting when we look at these things, and I, I get back to the point I was making earlier, this is just like a shell game because we talk about the taxes that we've slashed and we're cutting, yet we're proposing tax increases uh, on other people. And, and it, it, to me, it just doesn't, doesn't make sense. It, it doesn't make sense to me from another angle as well here, Tim, is I thought the idea behind the glide path to zero plan for taxes was to repopulate Kansas, to bring people back. Where do we need it the most? In Western Kansas. What would something like this do? It would cause people to get away from farming and help further depopulate Western Kansas at a highly accelerated rate. You know, Kansas State estimated in 2012 that the wheat land uh, net return was about $31 an acre. Well, this increase would take $35 an acre away. <clears throat> so who would want to, to use farmland for farming? If you want to convert it into commercial or residential property, that's fine, but there's no demand for that. What this is, is a sign of the greater shifting eastward of the power base of this state. And when we were talking about the 2012 redistricting round, and I said how much it hurt Western Kansas to lose representation and have it shifting over to Johnson County, where Johnson County believes that the, seemingly that we should take a big saw just west of Wichita and Salina, cut the rest of the state off and, and let it uh, float away. Uh, this, it, this seems perfectly in line with that, but it's inconsistent with this idea about bringing more people into Kansas and revitalizing this state. This just seems like petty politics, especially for us out here in Western Kansas. You know, and I get back to the point, I, I thought the Republican Party was the party about small business, which farmers are small business people, and I thought it was the party about cutting taxes, not raising taxes. This just seems so disingenuous to me, to, to, to everything that I thought the Republican Party was supposed to stand for. Well, and that's a, a fair point, but you know, I can't 
help but see on Twitter and in uh, news reports where I see quotes from Johnson County area legislators, how put upon they feel um, for what they see as them subsidizing Western Kansas. Uh, so I keep coming back to that as the driving force behind all of this. And of course, you know, once you want to prove a point, once you want to really drive that home, you'll look past things like, oh, fiscal conservatism in a drive to make that happen. All right. Let's take another commercial break. When we come back, I want to talk about uh, grocery taxes and the possibility of actually seeing those go away. We'll be back. I remember the moment. I'll never forget that moment. That moment? It was a moment that changed my life. I'd been training with my team for months, and now we had been called up for the first time. The real deal. Wildfires were getting dangerously close to homes. At that moment, I got my first taste of just how important the Guard is to my community. See how the Guard can be an important part of your life at NationalGuard.com. When it comes to the safety of your family, who do you trust? Protection Shelters provides quality, affordable, safe shelters to ride out unpredictable Kansas storms, business, community, or home installations. Call Protection Shelters today. Your safety and peace of mind is our priority. Gin Blossoms, live Friday, February 27th at the Orpheum. A benefit to fight cancer, supporting the Dragon Master Foundation. Tickets on sale now at select seat the EMC Cake Land Reading Caravan, awarding $500 grants to elementary libraries all across Cake Land. If you know of a librarian or teacher you believe deserves recognition, you can nominate them at cake.com. Hollywood's biggest A-listers come together for these five words. And the Oscar goes to... With Jennifer Aniston, Oprah Winfrey, Dakota Johnson, Jennifer Hudson, and Channing Tatum. Neil Patrick Harris hosts the Oscars, live tonight on ABC. This is it, the place where it all comes together, the crossroads of education and innovation, the epicenter of creativity, and the ground floor to infinite possibilities. Because when you find yourself in the right place at the right time, you can catch lightning in a bottle, harness its power, and you can create a future only you can imagine. For dreamers of all interests and from all walks of life, that time is now, and that place is Wichita State. Join us. And welcome back. We're going to talk about grocery taxes and a, uh, a proposal by a couple of lawmakers to actually cut grocery taxes. We, we saw this last session, and this session I think it looks a little different, but uh, I tell you, it, to me it sounds like, at least on the surface, a good idea. The challenge, of course, is when we're already in a, in a hole on the budget, if you cut grocery taxes, how do you make up that amount of money? And, and so, PJ, we're kind of in, a, in between a rock and a hard place on this, I think. We are. We've, we've known for ever since... I can remember there have been at least once a session somebody brings up the fact that uh, taxing groceries is kind of a really unfair thing to do, that, that it hurts the poorest people. Um, you know, taxing prescription drugs is kind of the same thing. Um, I, I think that it, the right thing to do would be to eliminate the tax on groceries. Uh, there's no question in my mind that that would be the right thing to do. How it would be accomplished in an atmosphere where you're trying to fill a billion dollar budget hole is a matter of just practicality. I just don't think it can be, I don't think it'll go anywhere this session simply because in order for a tax break like that to get, it, it the break goes to people who are not the powerful people and so their voices don't get heard very loudly in Topeka or Washington DC for that matter. And um, so I, I just think that uh, that the desire to keep that money to you know to keep the blood flow as low as possible is going to supersede um, the the feelings of those people who know that it's the right thing to do for people who are struggling. Chapman PJ just expressed a rather jaded viewpoint on this topic, but unfortunately, possibly a pretty accurate viewpoint on this topic. I think you know this is a this is an issue that really impacts uh, people on fixed incomes, elderly folks, poor people, and it just may not get much attention. It, that's exactly right. You know, it's the most regressive of taxes. Um, and so you know, we should be particularly sensitive to that. But at a time when the legislature is trying to find new ways 
to bring in uh, more revenues. The idea of restricting that part of revenue is probably something that a lot of legislators wouldn't have the stomach for, but it is something that needs to be addressed. And it's nice to see some bipartisanship because you have a Democrat, Aletha Faust Goudeau, and a Republican, Michael O'Donnell, Michael O'Donnell yeah. coming together to, to work on this and, and propose this. That may end up getting it a little bit more traction than PJ seems to think. Um, but I still default back to her belief that just in a session like this, I can't see any kind of additional revenue cuts making it through uh, just because of the dire situation we're in. Jim Ward, if you are still with us, is, does this thing have any, any, any shot? Jim, are you there? The note, the fiscal note on us um, repealing the sales tax on food is like 300 to $350 million. And that's like um, a pipe dream right now. Though it is the right thing to do, we're one of like only a half a dozen states that tax food, which is the prime necessity of life. Um, but there's absolutely no revenue or no way to replace that lost revenue at this point in time. You know, and Jim, that's, it's, it's such a sad statement you make. You even sound like you're sad talking about it because it is. It, it's, it's, it is the most regressive of taxes, as Chapman just said. And, uh, and the fact that this really doesn't, I think we can all just honestly say this doesn't have a chance of passing. It's kind of sad. It, it really is. And it really isn't the way. This isn't Kansas. The people of Kansas are not that cold-hearted um, that 191,000 people don't pay any income tax at all while well, we're, we're increasing taxes on middle class and working class families. And in fact, the governor proposed a couple of years ago to remove, for the most extremely poor, there's an income tax credit that they can use to get some of their sales tax back in their income tax. Um, he tried to remove that. That's just not, I mean, I think most Kansas would say that's just not the way we want to fund our state government. All right, guys, on that note, let's take another commercial break. This is our big one for the show. And when we come back, we'll talk about U.S. Attorney Barry Grissom calling out Chris Kobach. Very interesting statements were made. We'll be back in two and a half minutes. Make your tax dollars go farther at Cherry Orchard Furniture. All recliners on sale now starting at $197. Lift recliners only $598. Free layaway or free financing up to 36 months. Don't miss this huge tax time savings event at Cherry Orchard Furniture. Hey ladies, couldn't you really use a fun day? You know, shopping, good food, maybe even get the diva treatment, all for a good cause. Get it all at the 10th Annual Shopportunity, an event especially for women, Thursday, April 23rd at New Market Square. You can even upgrade to the Diva Club for some extra special treatment. Best of all, Shopportunity benefits people with disabilities through Independent Living Resource Center. Call or visit cake.com to get your advanced tickets before they're gone. Shopportunity, together with these sponsors and Cakeland. Ten candidates are vying for your vote, and Tuesday night on Cake.com, each will get a chance to convince you they should be Wichita's next mayor. Susan Peters moderates a Wichita mayoral forum Tuesday at 7 p.m., live streamed only on Cake.com. Educated voters make informed decisions. That's why Cakeland Votes is tracking the Wichita mayoral race for you. With the latest news, meet the candidate video profiles and live streams of mayoral forums. Get informed. Go to CakelandVotes.com. Cake News, tracking the big stories. Bullet struck the eight-year-old boy. Now being rushed to surgery. Still in critical condition. Alerting you to breaking news and weather. Members of the Sedgwick County Fire Department were able to save a life today. Kellogg really has been the trouble spot. Five to six accidents. This is one of the first light outs. Protecting you and your family. Social media app, Yik Yak. Every message is anonymous. Awful stuff being said. Naming names. Always tracking, always alerting, always protecting. Cake News. In Kansas, weather conditions can change quickly from clear to severe. When a storm is on the horizon, when the clock is ticking, you need time. Cake First Alert is there, tracking, alerting, protecting. Showing you what's happening now, preparing you for what's coming next. Keeping you hours, even days ahead of the storm. Giving you the time you need. Jay Prater on the Cake First Alert team. Always tracking, always alerting, always protecting. Make your tax dollars go farther at Cherry Orchard Kids Corner. Wichita's best selection of in-stock kids furniture with bunk beds from $198, cribs just $249, twin mats $59. Don't miss these tax time savings. On sale only at the Kids Corner. A rather interesting 
<coughs> excuse me, I get choked up talking about this, PJ, and entertaining, I must say, war of words between U.S. Attorney Barry Grissom and Secretary of State Chris Kobach recently when talking about voter fraud in the state of Kansas. And I, I tell you, this one, it's almost like a soap opera. You know, they're going back and forth on this stuff, and, and some of the comments have gotten quite, uh, quite nasty. And uh, this latest round was, I think, pretty interesting. Oh, I thought it was very interesting. Um, I, th I think it's, it's fitting that every once in a while somebody does call out Chris Kobach because his, his um, allegations are so spurious that it's, it's just amazing that anyone buys into it in the first place. But his comment was that he had sent, he needed prosecutorial power over voter fraud issues because he had sent these cases repeatedly to the U.S. Attorney's Office and they were not prosecuted. And then the U.S. Attorney comes back and says, I've checked my records, I don't see any cases you've sent me in four and a half years, there's not a single solitary one been referred over from your office. Uh, and I do know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, and because Kobach had said, you know, he just doesn't know what he's talking about. I said, well, I do know what I'm talking about and I know that no cases have been referred to me. And then there was no more conversation on that topic. <laughs> Let's get uh, let's get Chapman to jump in here. Chapman, this was an interesting one because I don't understand how Chris Kobach would have thought that Barry Grissom wouldn't have responded to this. I mean, he he, he flat out called Barry Grissom. He's out and said he didn't know what he was talking about when it came to voter fraud. And the the, the AP uh, obtained Grissom's response mm -hmm. to Kobach. It included this gem, according to the article against the City Star. Pretty much what PJ just said. So we can avoid misstatements of facts for the future. For the record, we have received no voter fraud cases from your office in over four and a half years. And I can assure you, I do know what I'm talking about, end quote. This was uh, like uh, Chris Kobach posting up top of the key and Takeo Cotton from the Shockers coming in and just swatting it away. <laughs> this, was, this was a big throwdown. Uh, for, for Grissom to say that. And it even gets worse for the secretary because it, the uh, Kobach uh, said that the reason that they didn't send any cases to Grissom was because of a lack of action on previous voter fraud cases sent by his predecessor. But you may recall that Ron Thornburg, the, his predecessor at the Secretary of State's office, said, well, we never had any cases of voter fraud to send <laughs> to Grissom. <laughs> so everything kind of folds back on each other uh, here. This just gets better and better. <laughs> yeah. I think we all knew all along that there wasn't any voter fraud going on. It's, it's been a made up problem and so, or solution in search of a problem from day one. Jim Ward, hop in. This is uh, this one's ripe for the picking for you. Um, I think it's uh, it, it, again. I, I you know we, we're laughing about this, and I, I'm making light of it. Uh, but it's, it's it's honestly it's pretty serious stuff. Well, and, and especially when you think of the background, which are 20 to 25 thousand Kansans who are having their votes suppressed based on allegations by Chris Kobach that there's all this fraud going on, and every time he's called on it, it comes out to be untrue. And this in exchange happened because Chris Walnut was being challenged during late in the campaign about these allegations of voter fraud and why there were so many people being denied their right to vote. And he blamed Barry Grissom's office. He said, well, I've been sending him over there, and they are prosecuting him. And Barry sent him a letter right after the election, and, and the quote's been already stated a couple of times, but basically says you've not done it ever in your four years as Secretary of State. And how this came out was Chris is up here now trying to get prosecutorial authority, the ability to bring cases against these alleged fraud. And that this was brought up to him to say, why would we give you, you, you haven't used the tools available to you, um, the U.S. attorney or the county and district attorneys, um, why would we, we extend your power in this way? And Chris was left speechless virtually. He, he didn't have a good answer for any of the questions presented to him. And, and see, that's, that's, a, that's a good point, Jim. Here's, here's where I'm, I'm going with this. If he's not referring anybody to these various uh, district attorneys, or in this case, the, the U.S. attorney, for prosecution, but he wants the prosecutorial power, who's he going to prosecute? Exactly. We already have a system of prosecutors in our state. We have county attorneys, we have district attorneys, we have an attorney general, we have the U.S. Attorney's Office. None of these people are saying we are being overwhelmed with fraud cases, voter fraud cases. In fact, 
the chief law enforcement officer of the federal government in Kansas said, we haven't had one case presented to us by Chris Kobach. So that begs the question, why would we spend money in this time without resources to empower Chris Kobach to be a prosecutor when we have all these tools available and he hasn't used them? Because there is no voter fraud in Kansas. It's just a subterfuge for him to suppress votes and try to manipulate elections. And Chapman, this is another instance where we see local control being taken away by the state or attempting to be taken away by the state. Yeah, that's exactly right. We have, as has already been said, we have the system in place. Even if there were some issues with uh, prosecutorial uh, processes at the local level, that doesn't necessarily mean that you consolidate everything in the Secretary of State's office. Reform the processes, make those work. But we're still in search of the problem for which all of these solutions have been proposed. And PJ, we already have people whose job it is to prosecute crime in place, doing these jobs. Let them do their jobs, why not? And why does he need to take on this extra, extra bit of power? And I think that because it's an extra bit of power and he wants it, I think, it, he sees it as a platform. Um, and in the case of who would he prosecute, that would be a really interesting question. No. Would, would he go after some of the people whose votes have already been suppressed? Would would he, uh, you know, use his power of harassment? Well, I think what needs to happen now, after Barry Grissom says that, uh, Chris Kobach needs to produce some examples of these people that he's referred to Barry Grissom's office for prosecution. Mm -hmm. he, I think he has to. And if he can't... Yeah. <laughs> and he can't because they don't exist. Yeah, because I, I think the line in the sand has been drawn and drawn in it, I think it's pretty plain, quite frankly, here. So interesting, interesting statements by Chris Kobach and Barry Grissom. And, I, and again, it's a head scratcher because I think Chris Kobach is a very bright guy. He's been on the show a couple of times. He's, he's, he's obviously not stupid by any stretch of the imagination. I just don't know how he thought that this statement wouldn't come back and bite him. Maybe he just thought Barry Grissom wouldn't say anything. I don't know. And maybe he thought nobody would pay attention. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, he's, this hasn't gotten a lot of coverage. No, and, and he, has gotten, he has gotten away with repeating uh, you, you know, his allegations of things that he's already been called out on and, and, and had to admit that, that there was no substance to what he said previously, and it doesn't stop him from saying it again next time. Yeah. All right, let's take another commercial break. We need to stay on time. We've got some good stuff to cover even here at the end of the show. Medicaid expansion, human trafficking, two things we'll cover in the next segment. We'll be back. It's gonna be big because tomorrow it's our biggest Oscar morning after party ever. Yeah, it is going to be epic, star studded, filled with crazy mad surprises. So we'll see you from Hollywood on GMA. Tomorrow, it's the ultimate Oscar party. Add curb appeal with Larson and Menards. This Larson Lakeview full view storm door with a retractable screen is available in seven colors with your choice of four easy to install quick fit keyed handle sets. Your choice, $269. Impress your neighbors with an ideal garage door. All five-star garage doors are on sale. These premium five-star doors feature a durable three-layer insulated construction, making them more durable and dent resistant. A 9 by 7 door is only $369. Save big money at Menards. We expose the scams. Guess what, that check, it's going to bounce. We hold the cheaters accountable. We won't tolerate people here that don't want to obey the rules. We follow the turns of every story. Wherever smart meters are used, they have problems. To uncover the secrets just beneath the surface. A huge reason for it going up is greed. And make the wrongs right. To a recommendation that the administrator's license be suspended or revoked. The Kick News I-Team. Always tracking, always alerting, always protecting. If you want the best car and you're holding out for the best deal, why wait? You can drive a new Honda right now with zero down, zero security deposit, and zero first month's payment. Or save now on the Accord with better gas mileage than Fusion, now just $199 a month. Just $159 a month gets you a new Civic with a backup camera standard. You won't find that with Corolla. Want a great car and a great deal? Why wait? And why settle for less than a Honda? See your Kansas Heartland Honda dealer now. On the next Good Morning Kansas. Who won, who lost, and who is making headlines? We are tracking Oscar results on Monday's GMK. And after a snowy weekend, we're tracking school closings. We'll have the latest on GMK. And welcome back. We talked a little bit about Medicaid expansion and some of the different plans out there. A couple of them by Republican lawmakers last week, and I got... Uh, uh, beat up pretty heavily in, in emails about this and probably deservedly so, quite frankly. So 
Uh, again, I, we, we try to be fair on the show, and if we give one side, and we, we gave one side last week, we, we need to give a, the other side this week. So let's talk about Medicaid expansion for a couple of minutes, and, and, and PJ, what do you think are the possibilities here? Well, I think there's, I think there's like a, a snowball's chance that we will actually get a Medicaid expansion passed. Mm -hmm. um, in spite of the fact that it makes perfect sense, uh, would solve some res revenue problems or help some revenue problems considerably if, if the data that's now coming out of Kentucky is to be believed. Um, they expanded Medicaid. They found that more people than they even anticipated. They thought they might get 200,000 additional people. They got 400,000. Uh, the net revenue gain to the state from the economic benefit of the expansion is gonna be close to a billion dollars <coughs> over a, a 10 year period. Um, the, the report that came out, it was the Del, uh, Deloitte Consulting in the University of Louisville's Urban Studies Institute that did the report for the governor's office, um, said that the positive economic impact has, has more than offset any expenses of covering um, these new people. Not to mention that it's the humane and correct thing to do to help people be able to access health care when they or their children are sick. It's, um, it's demoralizing to hear people talk about the, the poor people deserving to be poor to the point that they should have to sit and watch their children die. It's, it's just ridiculous. And we, we could both improve revenue and do the right thing for humanity by expanding Medicare. Um, there are some proposals to expand it, um, c kind of like a couple of other states have done mm -hmm. in a way that, that Kansas would set the parameters for how the expansion would go. Um, I think it just makes sense to figure out a way to do it and, and get it done. Jim Ward, uh, morally, right thing to do. Fiscally, that may be the thing that gets more people's attention right now. Um, yeah, Tim, it's morally, it, it's immoral to deny 150 to 170,000 Kansas health insurance that we've already paid for. Um, that t um, 29 other states, including red, red states like Arkansas, uh, Indiana, um, have expanded. We have three bills this year. I introduced a bill that simply expands Medicaid to the maximum amount of, uh, under the Affordable Care Act. Tom Sloan from Lawrence and his committee, Vision 2020, built a, a bill that is more based on uh, the Arkansas model where we would um, give vouchers and they would buy insurance through the exchange um, and have some work training requirements and some co-pays. Uh, and then there's a third bill that was introduced by the hospital association that basically um, changes a law that would allow the governor to uh, expand Medicaid on his own and also directs that a waiver would be developed with those kinds of principles in it um, by buying the insurance on the exchanges, work training results. Um, I think it would get out of the health committee in the house. I think the vote would be very close in the House chamber. More and more of my rural Republican friends are hearing from their hospitals about how this is going to cause mm -hmm. them either to close their doors or to significantly reduce the services they can provide because of the lost revenue. Um, I'm not sure the Senate's pretty dug in, but we're still being denied the opportunity even to debate or vote on this issue, and that's wrong. Chapman, uh, your thoughts on this uh, from a fiscal standpoint, is it do uh, you think it's legitimate that the state could see some economic growth because of this? It is not because if you look at the uh, plan that uh, DJ was referencing, it makes some assumptions about federal monies going in that certainly aren't guaranteed. Um, and it also assumes that there's kind of a linear progression. Hey, Chapman, um, that, that I'm there's gonna... a steady number of people continue to add that it really work that way. So I think that there, there may be some heads. I don't think that the billion dollars is anything that uh, is even close to reasonable. And all of that happens over a 10 year span. You have to go into the red for at least a year before you start realizing a lot of those gains. So the same conversation you're having about the food tax plan, we have to have here. Morality aside, this is making a budget balance. And you know, would we really be willing to put $150, $200 million into this this year to be able to possibly get the federal government be and a lot of people sign up over time, amortize that over the course of a decade? That's a good sell. 
Chapman, I, I'm sure you had some really good stuff to say there. I could only understand about once, about every second word. I apologize. We seem to be uh, having some problems with your, your connection. Um, let's talk briefly about human trafficking and human trafficking penalties. And, and, and Jim, I want you to just take this one for a couple of minutes, if you, if you will. And, and uh, we saw uh, Derek Schmidt, uh, the Attorney General, Kansas Attorney General, uh, is proposing uh, some civil uh, abilities for human trafficking victims to uh, sue their, their, their abusers. Yeah, um, about two or three years ago, the Attorney General brought to us a package of criminal laws. First of all, let's un unpack the term human trafficking. That is where women, usually girls, teenage girls to the early 20s, are taken from other countries, usually in dire financial straits, Africa, China, India, brought to the United States under various pretenses and then put into the sex trade, typically. And that's what human trafficking is. And we have we built some pretty strong criminal laws. What the Attorney General is suggesting now, which I, I think is a good idea, says it would empower these women, these girls, once they are freed from the abusers, the human traffickers, to sue for damages. Because this is a very a lucrative industry and um, there may be resources there to try to help these girls rebuild their lives. Um, and it would be a civil action to, to obtain money from these abusers. And Jim, I, I think actually, and I, I disagree with you just a little bit, I, I know that there are quite a few situations where women and, and children are brought in from foreign countries, but I think also just runaways in the United States are, are considered to be part of this too, that are, that are bought and sold. Yes. For the for the sex trade, so it's it, it really crosses I think all cultural and age barriers and even sex. Uh, there are boys that are involved in this as well, which so it, it it impacts a lot of people. Yeah, no, absolutely, you're right, Tim. It does. It's not just a export. It it, it is runaways and and children who get caught out on the street, um, and both men and women, boys and girls. What, what um, do you what do you think uh, the chances of this passing and happening? I, I think there's a very good chance. I think we took some really good steps to cr when the criminalization of this behavior and adding some um, enhanced penalties, and I think the legislature will look um, favorably on this um, civil remedy, too. All right. Let's take a commercial break. When we come back, we'll talk about House Bill 2234 and fruitcakes. I'm serious. In the next two minutes, we'll be back. <laughs> Chevy trucks always find new roads to conquer. We started with a family of the most dependable, longest-lasting, full-size pickups on the road. And now, introducing the pickup that unanimously won the 2015 Motor Trend Truck of the Year. All made of high-strength steel, only at one place, your Chevy dealer. Now during Truck Month, GM owners can trade up to get a total value of $8,000 on select Silverados in stock the longest. It's Truck Month. See your local Chevy dealer today. Hollywood's biggest A-listers come together for these five words. And the Oscar goes to... With Jennifer Aniston, Oprah Winfrey, Dakota Johnson, Jennifer Hudson, and Channing Tatum. Neil Patrick Harris hosts the Oscars, live tonight on ABC. The 10th Annual Shoppertunity, an event especially for women, Thursday, April 23rd at New Market Square. Shoppertunity benefits people with disabilities. Call or visit cake.com to get your advance tickets before they're gone. Shoppertunity, together with these sponsors and Cakeland. The Schofield Buick GMC Winter Event is here. And now's the time to drive America's best trucks and SUVs. Save thousands this month on SUVs. Buy the affordable GMC Terrain for just $22.9. Or save over $6,000 and buy the Acadia with seating for eight for only $28.4. Plus choose from our huge inventory of 2015 Yukon Denali's and XL's. We made the switch. So come on in, take it for a spin, and switch to Schofield Buick GMC. If your old car just isn't doing it for you anymore, we'll match you up with the car of your dreams. During the Meet Your Match event at Supercar Guys. Put just $8 down and drive away in a car you'll love today. A cute little car, $8 down. Big macho truck, $8 down. A van with junk in the trunk, $8 down. A sassy SUV, $8 down. Meet Your Match for just $8 down at Supercar Guys. Buying a car doesn't have to suck. Representative Virgil Peck is the gift that keeps on giving recently, it seems like, and uh, I know that probably won't make him terribly happy that I'm saying this, but I can't, uh, I can't resist. We, we have, a, have a new comment from uh, Representative Peck concerning 2234, 
And Chapman, if, if you're there, I'm going to let you start out with this one. And, and I don't even know if I should identify you as Chapman because I don't want to get you in trouble. <laughs> but you can identify me by name. And okay. first of all, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, yes you're back. You're better now. Great. Um, but uh, my, my question about House Bill 2234 is, was it something I said? Uh, and Michael Smith and Burdette Loomis, Ed Flint G, um, and Mark Peterson, and now, of course, we've added Dwayne Gosen on yep. uh, for a little bit uh, in Insight, Kansas. Uh, it kind of seemed like a shot across our bows um, that uh, we, as you, most of us are university professors, and uh, this bill would force us to strip our university affiliations away from newspaper columns that specifically mentioned members of the state legislature. Uh, so we were a little bit surprised by this since uh, Representative Peck, who introduced the bill, and uh, others that were affiliated with it or were at least associated with the introduction of this bill had never really uh, corresponded with us or criticized us, uh, taken us to task publicly for what we had said, and then suddenly we see this that would uh, force us to strip our affiliations. Uh, so uh, the story percolated for a couple of days, and uh, you saw the Eagle print a uh, letter from 70 academics from across the country uh, joining us in questioning the, the need for something like 2234. And uh, that caused uh, Representative Peck to uh, say that uh, anyone who was writing about this was a uh, fruitcake. And, you know, in this <laughs> line of work, whether it's my columns, my appearances here, what have you, I love it. I get called a lot of names. I'm a big boy. And that's perfectly fine. I've never been called a fruitcake before. So, points for creativity. <laughs> Oh my gosh, Jim! I've got it. Okay, for for those keeping score at home, Jim, and we're gonna we're gonna have you weigh in in a second. Initially, when this whole thing broke, Representative Peck uh, was said he didn't write the the bill. Then one of his fellow Republican lawmakers said he did indeed write the bill. Then Peck came back and said, "Well, if he said I wrote it, I must have. I don't remember. Seems like an odd thing to forget." Uh, he says he's, he he wasn't sure. Now he's come back and said, "No, he did indeed not write the bill." and denies it. So um, so who wrote the bill, Jim? You're up there in Topeka. You're looking around. Tell us. <laughs> well, let's just put aside the goofy comment, okay? Yeah. This, this bill underlines some serious problems that I think um, really are serious. The first one is the whole idea that it's bad for smart people who have earned credentials to go in the newspaper or on television, express views about public policy is wrong. And it shows you the extent that some people will go to try to stifle dissenting opinions. They don't like to be challenged. The second problem is the idea that um, you don't know who wrote this bill. Mm -hmm. What happens is the most common way, like I mentioned earlier, I introduced a Medicaid expansion bill. I put my name on that. I was proud of it. Yep. I've been trying for three years to pass Medicaid expansion. Um, the second way you can introduce a bill in the legislature is to go to a committee and get the chairman's attention and say, I'd like to introduce a bill, judiciary appropriations, on whatever topic it is, and it will come out as a committee bill. Mm -hmm. Now, this is way in the weeds, but you don't know who introduced that bill. They don't make a record of that and put it in the minutes. We should. People should know where bills like this come from Absolutely. And, and who is presenting them. Um, and that's a really serious transparency issue that I think um, by um, his comments – Representative Peck has helped us next time to get the rules changed. That when it's all right to go get a committee bill, there's nothing wrong with that. I got a couple of committee bills late because I missed the deadline for individual bill uh, um, introductions. Nothing wrong with it. But I have no problem with people knowing I did that. Um, it sounds like Mr. Peck, or Representative Peck, sorry, um, does. I know that he was, if not the drafter, involved in it because I've heard him talk to other representatives about this bill. Um, I don't know if he feels embarrassed by the bill now or what, but um, it's a legitimate question, and well, um, it does expose a problem. Well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go on record and say it right now. Whoever wrote this bill is a coward, because if you're not going to admit that you wrote the bill, you're a coward. Uh, if you wrote it, be proud of it and say you wrote it. I mean, you obviously thought it was right, and he still says he thinks he, it's a good bill, so what's the, what's the big deal? If you think it's a good bill, come out and say you, you wrote the thing, PJ. I, I just don't understand that, and I think it shows... I think it shows whoever wrote this thing is a coward. 
Yeah, I think it's kind of like uh, if you're going to if you're going to write an editorial that you think is is going to be controversial, you don't want your byline on it. It's sort of the same. Mm -hmm. um, that's a journalism equivalent of it. Um, and I think, you know, as a journalist, um, I always like to use the credentials of, of learned people who, you c who your readers would think have a, a credible opinion on something, uh, that they have studied the subject on which they're commenting, and they have a knowledge of that subject, and that's why you're interviewing them. And then to take that credential away from them uh, in print is to deny the readers the opportunity to know that a person who d who is familiar with this, who has studied it, who 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 has an opinion that perhaps you should listen to, um, you're taking that away from from the readers. They have no opportunity to know who this guy is. And now I would say that you know most viewers of this program are going to know Chapman Hackaway is it uh, at forties, <laughs> and and, um, and they're going to know that Ed Flinch is at Wichita State. There, it's it's not going to be that they that they won't be identifiable yeah. to people who know that. But it, especially to people who may be reading an op-ed in the newspaper, that may not be the case. Chapman, we've got about a minute and a half left in the show. I've never met Virgil Peck. He may be a very nice man. I, I really mm -hmm. don't know. But I go back to saying if you're going to write it, own up to it. Have the guts to say you wrote the thing or say you made a mistake. Exactly. And uh, I think that's tied in with what PJ was talking about, too. This is so much about accountability. And if you're going to introduce a bill, be accountable for the both the positive and the negative. There's consequences. You go ahead and you face up to those. And that goes for this bill and it goes for every decision made by anyone in a legislature. If you're going to be criticized, then put on your big boy pants and take the criticism uh, but you know, don't try to squelch criticism. That's what is, is fatal to a democracy. We simply can't have that. So I hope that this is not some uh, thinly veiled attempt to try to squelch dissent and criticism because in this day and age, we need it here in Kansas. We need it in Washington, D.C. more than ever. Well, I, and I tell you, you know, we, we never get any criticism on this show. So. <laughs> I wouldn't even know what that was like. We get it all the time, actually. We do get emails, and I read them on the air, on the air occasionally. And I'll, you know, I'll admit, we, we don't, this is not a perfect show by any, any stretch, so we, we get our own share. And we worried at some of your uh, emails, in fact, some critical ones next week. I was going to do it this week, just didn't get to it. So anyway, we're out of time, guys. Thanks for being on the program. Thank you for watching the show. If you have any comments or questions, even mean, nasty ones, please email me at thisweekinkansas at cake.com. Thanks for watching the show, and I truly hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you.